Okay, we're back and we're going to continue here in the first chapter of the book of Acts now. I want to pick up our reading in, uh, we've read down through verse number 14. So let's pick up our reading here in verse number 15. Although we're going to go back in just a few minutes and pick up some of the things that are said in verses 12, 13, etc. But let's pick up right now and read in verse 15 of the first chapter of the book of Acts. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue Acheldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men, which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So they're setting down the criteria here for the replacement of Judas. Verse 23 says, And they appointed two. They had two candidates, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place, And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. All right. So we're finishing up here in this segment, the next few moments. We're going to finish up chapter number one. But again, uh, on page 21 in your notebook, let's look back there for just to get an idea of our um, outline and what we've covered thus far. We said that the book of Acts is organized according to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, The first approximately 7 into the 8th chapter, we see that the word, the gospel, was to go to Jerusalem. And then uh, chapter 8, verse 4, 5, up to chapter 13, was to go to Judea and Samaria. And then in the 13th chapter, we see that Paul and Barnabas are sent by the church in Antioch. They are sent on what we call today Paul's first missionary journey. So, Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and then the uttermost part of the earth. We noted also that the book of Acts is a book of transition, transitioning from the Gospels, the life of Christ, his crucifixion, his resurrection, transitioning in from the kingdom, Israel, primarily speaking to Jewish people. Jesus said this to his disciples. He said he wanted them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I believe that's from Matthew chapter number 10. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul made mention of that himself even in the book of Romans. But the book of Acts takes us from a primarily Jewish audience to ultimately a primarily Um, Gentile audience by the time we get to Rome toward the end of the book of Acts. But we see the transitions from Gospels to Epistles, Judaism to Christianity, Jerusalem to Rome, Kingdom to the Church, and Law to Grace, just by way of review. Notice a couple uh, paragraphs down from that. We're to be witnesses, and here in your text I've listed several references in the book, in the book of Acts, where, we, where the word witness is used over and over again. 
So uh, that's the goal. The goal Jesus had for his disciples was to be fishers of men, to be witnesses, to tell what they knew about Christ and to share it with somebody else. We call that evangelism. We call it soul winning. Lots of different terms are used, but basically we're talking about being a witness, like in a courtroom. We're called upon by the court to go to the witness stand, and we are asked to tell what we know about this particular person or this case or set of circumstances. We are witnesses. So as a witness, we are asked to tell what we know. What do you know about Jesus? Who is he? What did he do? What kind of a relationship do you have with him? So we learned a lot. We learned in the, in the first 14 verses that these uh, people, these disciples, that they were obedient, that they were praying people, there was great unity among them, they were growing in the relationship, but they had been promised, at the bottom of 21, they had been promised the power in the ministry of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, and they were told to wait for that promise to come. And we've listed some passages here in your notes that uh, precede um, uh, where we are right now. So our study, again, is uh, to focus on raw, first century Christianity. We want to know what was important to them, their priorities. We want to know their strategies, their methodologies. We want to know what kind of character these individuals were. So here's an outline about the middle of that page, 22. We see the outline for the remainder of this chapter. Uh, Roman numeral number two, the upper room. There's two things primarily that take place here. There's a prayer meeting and there's a business meeting. The prayer meeting, obviously, getting the group of people united together, understanding their purpose, developing their core and strategies and and, um, uh, encouraging one another, mutual encouragement. And then there's a business meeting in chapter number one, and that business meeting is intended to replace a Jew, the fallen Judas and what he has done. So we have read uh, 12 up through uh, the end of the chapter and uh, looking on page 23 we look at the outline over there. It says the prayer meeting 12 through 15 who attended. There's a list of the individuals. The 11 were there. Mary and some godly women were at this meeting. Jesus half brothers were there and about 120 people. So um, remember, we're not, we're not long after the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. And at the crucifixion, as we noted before, things weren't going very well. They weren't very positive about what had happened when Christ was crucified. In fact, certainly they were de dejected, despondent, depressed, and uh, they were ready, if they hadn't already mentally, they're ready to throw in the towel. This has been a failed experiment. And so they're hiding. They're running for cover. They're not witnessing, let's put it that way. They're not testifying that they knew Jesus and they were one of his followers. They were keeping that pretty much to themselves, for sure. But even in this brief period of time after the resurrection, look at the momentum that this group of people, it says in verse 15, it says that there's now 120. Now, hundreds and thousands of people have received Christ's ministry in that they heard him. But how many of them actually became disciples in those early days? That's really questionable. How many? There were a lot of spectators, but there weren't a lot of participators. There were a lot of people sitting up in the grandstands watching what was going on, but there were very few participators. But now, again, the resurrection of Christ, it's changed everything. We see we have 120. We noted before the Sabbath day journey. We noted uh, these uh, three individuals in verse 13, kind of the inner core of the disciples or of the apostles, Peter, James, and John. These are the three fellows that uh, were found with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter number 17. 
in some way they were leaders of the leaders they were they had some kind of preferential treatment uh, and probably because they had uh, assignments that might have been or were more important than some of the other uh, disciples actually had. But it says that uh, in verse 15 that Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and uh, he said, men and brethren, this scripture must have been fulfilled. And he's talking about scripture, some Old Testament uh, references that he connects with the demise of Judas. He said the scripture must be fulfilled in 16 concerning Judas in verse 17. Now Judas was chosen by Christ. His, apost his apostleship was not an accident. His defection was prophesied in Psalm 41. And we have actually listed, we've spelled that uh, Psalm a passage, that verse right out. Verse 18 says, this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. That is his 30 pieces of silver. The text in Matthew 27 may seem to contradict, but it's not difficult to combine the two passages and what's said about Judas's demise here and what the book of Matthew says in chapter number 27. But notice in your notes there, uh, chapter 27 Verses 3 through 8 are included. We might point these phrases or words out. Verse 5, he hanged himself. Verse number 6, the price of blood. That was the silver mentioned in verse 5. And they were, then it says, and he bought with them the potter's field that was, was a place that was uh, set aside to bury strangers. It's called the field of blood. Called the field of blood, probably verse number 19, because it was purchased with blood money. It was purchased with blood money, the, uh, the uh, 30 pieces of silver, which Judas received from his uh, betrayal. The Psalms predicted Judas' death in verse number 20. We read, uh, for it is written in the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 69, Psalm 109. We've already mentioned Psalm 41. These three places certainly seem as um, Luke writing here in verse 20. He references the Psalms, and these three places in the Psalms certainly seem to be the places that Luke was thinking of when he wrote this. So now we see the election of, of uh, Judas's replacement. Two uh, candidates are brought forth, and uh, only one is going to survive the vote, kind of like a presidential election here. Joseph called Barsabbas, Matthias, and we noted up there in verse 22 the criteria that um, uh, verse 21 and 22, the criteria that they used for choosing uh, the, the replacement for Judas. It says in verse 21, wherefore of these men, which of these men which have accompanied with us all of the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out from among us, beginning, here it is, from the baptism of John. In other words, this individual had to be part of this cadre of disciples from the time that John was baptizing unto that same day that he was taken up. That's a reference to verse number 9 of chapter number 1. That is the ascension of Christ. So this replacement of Judas had to go back as far uh, as to the ministry of John the Baptist and we can go to Matthew chapter 3 when Christ was baptized by John the Baptist. That might be a good reference point. And that would take us from, from Matthew chapter 3 to Acts chapter 1. So these two men apparently had been disciples. Not apostles per se in the original 12, but they were disciples with, uh, with Christ. And so they were eyewitnesses. They had first-hand information of what had taken place. And then it says, and they prayed. It's a good thing to do. 
By the way, leadership is chosen. Jesus chose the 12 apostles. Uh, they it wasn't a, a congregational vote that chose the apostles. They were chosen by the leader, by the man that, um, that they would serve primarily. Leadership is chosen. But here we had two qualified individuals. Oftentimes when we choose uh, elders, deacons in our church, um, we have several good candidates, several good uh, individuals that fill our qualifications in our church. And so what we do in our church is we don't cast lots, but what we do is we ask the congregation, the membership of the congregation, to vote on these individuals to choose them. Now, personally, I don't believe necessarily that the individual or individuals that are chosen are necessarily the best Christians, or they're greater, or more important, or more spiritual. Not necessarily so. I believe this. I believe that God, through the congregation, through prayer, examining them, that when the vote is taken, that the men, that God, if this is done well, that the men that God wants, the individuals that God wants in those positions, that they will be brought into those positions. So that doesn't mean that the individuals who were not elected or not chosen to be the deacon or the elder or whatever the office is that you are choosing people for, it doesn't mean that they're unspiritual or that, the, you know, anathema is written over their head, on their forehead or whatnot. So we see that the election of Matthias, there's a nice little, little alliterative outline, the conditions, the candidates, the council, and then the choice that was made. We've talked about uh, verse 21. We've talked about verse number 22. Notice it says the resurrection will become the greatest proof of the ministry of Christ. We've emphasized that. The candidates, Joseph, Matthias, the council, what took place, they prayed, they, uh, and they showed which, whether of these two thou hast chosen. They're asking God to direct, and they gave forth their lots. <clears throat> Another uh, psalm that uh, is referred to, we've seen three already, Psalm 41, Psalm 69, Psalm uh, 109. We see here where it says, let his days be few and let another take his office. That verse is referenced also. So casting lots. Oftentimes uh, people are asked about what is casting lots all about? <clears throat> well, um, I can't give a definitive answer on that, or I should say I can't give the last word on the subject, but I took some time to do some research when I taught this originally, and I've looked through this uh, on some or several other occasions. So we're trying to give you here, towards the end of this lesson, some of the thoughts that we came up with. It says in verse 26 that they gave forth their lots. <clears throat> now assuming, and I do assume, and I believe to be true, that both of the candidates were well qualified, they cast lots and trusted the lots to divulge the winner. Proverbs 16.33 says, <clears throat> quote, the lot, lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. So, I guess, if I can use this, I don't want to be blasphemous or disrespectful to the process, but to think through this for a moment, let's say we're, you know, flipping a coin. That's something that's commonly done. So we say, Joseph is heads, Matthias is tails, all right? So we flip our coin, we get it, we go, ah, tails, <laughs> Matthias. That seems like, eh, that's just chance, isn't it? Casting lots had an element of chance in it, no doubt. It seems that way when we look at it. But what the disciples were doing was this. God can direct that coin or these lots. 
And so when the lots are cast, God can arrange the answer to that, that process. And so that when we get an answer as a result of the coin flip or the casting of lots, that the answer we get is the answer that God wants us to have. And the reason is this, and this happens a lot, I think, to all of us. We find ourselves in a situation, we really don't know exactly what to do. What should I do here? You know, and I got two options, or maybe more options, they're all good things. Let's say, uh, let's say that you're making a decision on which ministry in the church you ought to be a part of. Let's say these are the competing ministries. Sunday school, children's ministry, elementary age children, and teenagers or junior high young people. And you're thinking, you know, I would like to do both of these things. These are, these are right, they're in my wheelhouse, right up my alley. But you know, I've examined both of these. The need is the same. The opportunity is the same. I really don't see an advantage or disadvantage one way or another. I don't know which of these two to do. Well, if you can't figure that out, you know, don't sit and wait for a telegram for he from heaven. Now, I'm not saying you might not want to continue to pray about it, and maybe God will give you some more information or give some more light on that. But when you've done that sufficiently and you still can't come to an answer, you have to make a decision. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do then? Let's say b these are both good choices. Now, I've never done this. I never had to do it myself, and maybe I'm making up a, a, a situation, a hypothetical situation that isn't necessary. But if I were put in that situation, I said, you know, Lord, I got to do something about this. I can't do nothing about this. I can't remain undecided. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to flip a coin. Heads, I'm working with the kids, the younger kids. Tails, I'm working with the middle school kids. Okay, I'm working with the middle school kids. You must not like me. No, I'm just kidding, obviously. I would take that as an answer. Now, if God wants to derail that in some way, or if he wants to bring new light into the situation, sometimes, I know, I know some of you may, may disagree with what I'm saying here, but I think sometimes God gives you a choice. He really gives you a choice. Well, what do you want to do? Well, I, I want to do what God wants me to do. Well, what do you want to do? Well, I want to do what God wants me to do. Well, maybe God doesn't really care which of those two things you do. They're both good. And you will derive benefit from doing both. So, you choose. Is that okay? Is that blasphemous to say that God gives us a free will to make choices sometimes? I think not. Now, obviously, if God is showing me and I just go against what is obvious, what God has shown me through prayer or through counsel or through church or through reading, whatever it is, I need to follow God's direction. I believe God can use all of those things to give me direction. But if I'm really just lost and I don't know what to do, I might be tempted to cast some lots. These people did, and it worked out apparently very well for them. This is not a rare subject in the Bible. The subject is mentioned 70 times in the Old Testament and seven times in the New Testament. The actual process is disputed. One of the possibilities is the Urim and Thummim, that that was used uh, to discern. Now, I, the thing is, I don't think the apostles had access to the Urim and Thummim, and, and so uh, in this case, I don't think that is an option. What exactly took place, I don't know. But there was some level of confidence, obviously, after praying, that the results of casting of lots would produce the right results. 
uh, the practice was used for good things. It's not witchcraft. It's not like using a Ouija board or anything like that. We can see by the passages listed that these were good things that took place. Um, and then we've given the lot causeth contentions to cease and parteth between the mighty. Psalm 22 shows that the practice was used for gambling in the prophecy about Christ's garments of the crucifixion. And that may be where it gets the negative connotation. You know, the, the uh, soldiers at the crucifixion cast lots for his vesture. But it's used for good things many, many times in Scripture. I don't believe that the practice is acceptable or God's way of guiding and directing today. This was the final decision maker when the final choice was not clearly apparent. Nowhere is this condemned in the text or in Scripture. Matthias is never mentioned again. However, only Peter and John are mentioned after this. Most of the disciples, the apostles, are not mentioned after this uh, again. Who will be the 12th disciple noted on the wall of the New Jerusalem? Some of you theologues may be asking that question. These questions are a little bit more difficult. They're fun to talk about, to theorize, to um, philosophize about. But um, I don't have an answer to that question. I don't know. And there are uh, probably several potential answers to that. Some of the practical lessons here. Let's just look at some of the practical things here as we wrap this up. And this is important. The practicality of what we're doing is vitally important. Again, we're not engaging in a pure academic exercise in our Bible Institute classes. Certainly we want to gain knowledge. We're to grow in knowledge. But we're to also grow in grace. We're to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're warned in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that knowledge puffeth up. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Knowledge, if all we're doing is studying and we're in this class to get knowledge so we can dominate a conversation or so I can become the teacher or I can displace the pastor or whatever it is, that's arrogance. That's contentious. That's self-centered. Our institute goes beyond just gaining knowledge. How can I be a better Christian? How can I grow in grace and knowledge? How can I grow in grace? Jesus was full of grace and truth. So here's some practical lessons. Leadership is chosen. It's proven. You have to trust the people who, are, who have been placed above you, spiritually speaking, in your church, you have to trust those people that they are exercising good judgment, that they pray, that they are uh, spiritually minded, that they are uninhibited and unhindered in their relationship with God, uh, that they're in the word, that they understand principles and priorities. And when someone approaches you and says, I would like you to do this. Or maybe you volunteer to do something and someone says, I would rather you not. You have to trust the leaders in your church, those that God has placed above you. Leadership is God's doing. Jesus chose his apostles, his disciples. Those who, ha who, who are human have the capacity for failure and restoration. Restoration is accomplished by true repentance. We're talking about Judas, are we not? He was, I mean, think of the things that Judas experienced and saw in his brief lifetime with Christ, and yet he still got an F at the end of his test. But what brings about true restoration is true repentance. Leadership properly seeks God's will through prayer through scripture, and in the process of being aged and, uh, engaged in the Great Commission living. Earthly glory and applause are not guaranteed. Matthias who? <laughs> yeah, he was selected to replace Judas, but 
we don't ever read about him ever again. He's not a, a primary character in the book of Acts. He's mentioned here, and we just have to assume that he went on to fulfill uh, his duties and expectations in the years, how many ever years God gave him. And God is sovereign in this sense. God will accomplish his will. Now there is room for free will. In fact, free will is the most dangerous thing in the, in the universe. Your free will and my free will. Because we can go against what God has instructed us to do. But God is sovereign and in the end, things will be done to his pleasure. He will get what he wants in the end. And so will you. You will get what you want in the end. Let's take a break.